So I'm going to introduce the first person who is the co-director of ISR, Rodney Stark. He and I came to Baylor about the same time, almost 11 years ago. And uh, Rodney really needs no introduction, uh, but he's become a dear friend and colleague. You can see a number of his books outside on display, as well as other uh, books by ISR faculty. Um, so Rod, uh, come give us the first talk of our conference. Oh my, I've been sitting here with my back to you and I didn't notice how many of you came in. You're all aware that at least once a month, sometimes more often, there'll be a big story in the national press, always the same story, usually by the same suspects, having to do with the fact that religion is doomed. Last week, Daniel Dennett, the sage of Tufts University, was uh, quoted at great length in the Wall Street Journal about the fact that it's all over. We finally won, according to Dennett. Religion is dead. And if it looks like it's still healthy, that's because that's a dying spasm. Well, whatever else that may be, it's not news. People have been predicting the end of religion for more than three centuries. And true to form, the very first person who did it was an Anglican clergyman. Writing in 1710, Thomas Wollstone predicted that all traces of religion would be gone by 1900. Voltaire thought he was pessimistic. And in a letter to Frederick the Great, Voltaire said, now, it'll all be gone and over by 1810. Subsequently, these sorts of people got a little circumspect. And now, they will only say soon. They won't say when. That's all right because somehow they still get all the press. Um, Peter Berger, the sage of Boston University and once a visitor to Baylor, told the New York Times in 1968 that the 21st in the 21st century, religious believers are likely to be found only in small sects huddled together to resist the worldwide secular culture. The predicament of the believer is increasingly like that of a Tibetan astrologer on a prolonged visit to an American university. Now, the subsequent lionization of the Dalai Lama on American campuses suggests that there is another interpretation possible here. But the fact is, that it's the 21st century and it still hasn't happened. Moreover, the facts are that the world is probably much more religious than it was a century ago. It may in fact be more religious than it ever was. Never before has organized religion enrolled such a huge proportion of the world's population. Worldwide, 81% of the people belong to one of the major organized faiths. All of the great world religions are growing with the possible exception of Buddhism. And contrary to uninformed accounts, Christianity is growing far faster than either Islam or Hinduism. And regardless of their religion, 74% of the world's people say religion is an important part of their daily lives. 50% say they have attended a worship service in the past seven days. 
In very few nations do more than 5% claim to be atheists. And only in China, Vietnam, and South Korea do they exceed 20%. Furthermore, in every nook and cranny left by organized religions, all manner of unchurched spirituality and mysticisms are booming. <clears throat> there are more occult practitioners in Russia than there are medical doctors. 38% of the French believe in astrology. 35% of the Swiss agree some fortune tellers really can foresee the future. And nearly everyone in Japan takes a careful action to have their new car blessed by a Shinto priest. Probably can't get insurance if you don't. True. Now, where do these numbers come from? I mean, you're sitting out there saying, how does he know this? Because of a wonderful thing called the Gallup World Polls. They started in 2005, and by now they're doing an annual national survey in every one of 163 nations, which add up to 98% of the world's population. And by collapsing years, you can get huge case bases, 10, 15,000 in various countries, which means that the statistics are extremely stable and probably very accurate. Now, I have a book coming out uh, in the fall in which I use these data to cover the world. Here I'm going to only talk about a few places. Um, I'm certainly not going to talk about Europe because my colleague Philip Jenkins is going to do that. And I'm going to leave America alone because Byron is going to end the program with the United States. But let's begin with Latin America. For centuries, Latin America was alleged to be a Roman Catholic continent. The Catholic Almanac of 1949 reported that the percent Catholic in Argentina was 99.2%, that it was 98% in Bolivia, that it was 99.8% in Chile, and it made similar claims for the other Latin nations. The truth is that no more than 20 and usually closer to 10% of the people in any Latin American nation ever went to church. So few men entered the seminaries that all across the continent, most of the priests had always been imported from elsewhere in the world. Then came Protestant competition. During the second half of the 20th century, it finally became legal for Protestants to exist in Latin America, and they started converting tens of millions of people. Now, the Catholic Church, of course, had to respond. And their first response was something called liberation theology. And the assumption was that people were becoming Protestants because they were poor and deprived and powerless. So let's put some Marxism together with some Catholicism and let's go out and get them all to join base communities and we'll get rid of these Protestants. And despite the fact that the current Pope seems to think that's the way to go and that's the way he went in Argentina, it was a thunderous flop. Nobody joined. But then came some wiser heads, something called the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement. It met the, met the Pentecostals head on with the same kind of intense religion because people were not converting because they were poor, they were converting for religion. The rich were as likely as the poor to become Protestants. And you know what? The Catholic charismatic religious movement has greatly slowed 
the progress of Protestantism in Latin America. How did it do it? It did it by filling the churches. It's amazing, but in seven of the 18 major Latin American nations, weekly mass attendance today is above 60% a week. In six others, it's above 50% a week. Keep in mind that it's 31% in Spain and 29 in Canada, and we're talking about really full churches, uh, something hadn't been seen before. In 1960, there were 4,000 men in Catholic seminaries in Latin America. Today, there are well over 20,000. Religion worked. The more, the more important point is that what wasn't a Catholic continent is now very much a Christian continent. But it's nothing compared to South, Sub-Saharan Africa. There are more Christians in Sub-Saharan Africa than there are anywhere else in the world. A third of the world's more than two billion Christians are there, and of course my colleague has written about this at great length about Christianity in the global south, and it's true. Church attendance is extraordinary in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the Latin American attendance looks bad if you start looking at sub-Saharan Africa, where people tend to go at levels of 80 and 90 percent a week to long church services. Many of these people belong to African denominations. I mean, one started by Africans, but many also are Roman Catholics. And the Gallup World Poll statistics on the number of Catholics in the various African nations is way, way above what the Catholic Almanac claims. So, I got a hold of some people in the Vatican and asked them about it. They were delighted to hear the news, but they didn't know why. And they finally concluded that the priests are so busy with baptisms and confessions that they don't bother to count. And therefore, the numbers are 20 years old. And I guess that's probably what's going on. We could, of course, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing what's going on there. The fact, now I'd like to switch slightly and talk about the great Muslim revival. As recently as the 1960s, Western experts, including the CIA, assumed Muslims were rapidly becoming secularized. And they began teaching and reporting all of this at a very time in which a great renewal was going on in Islam that they didn't bother to look at. During the 1950s, about 100,000 pilgrims a year went to Mecca. By the mid-1970s, that number had risen to a million a year. In 2012, it topped three million. It could probably be as high as 10 or 15 million, but the Saudis won't give them more visas than that because it's so difficult to provide food and water and shelter in the middle of the desert. So three million is all they're letting come in. Even so, there are very few longitudinal data available on belief in Islam, but there are for Turkey but only for the last 20 years. Even so, you find enormous increases in things like mosque attendance. Um, the proportion who believe in hell went from 83 to 99. 83 is awfully high, but 99 means everybody. 99 means something else. It means that this isn't all about a bunch of impoverished folks running around in the Arab streets, so-called. The educated are, in fact, slightly more religious in the Muslim nations than the least educated. 
It turns out that, by the way, we'll find that's true in many other parts of the world, contrary to most sociologists. The CIA, of course, has now been, recently was, I think it was yesterday, the former deputy director of the CIA confessed they'd made a terrible mistake about the Arab Spring, that they, when the governments of Egypt and Libya and Yemen when I were overthrown, they thought that this was going to be uh, a great move towards secularization. They didn't look at any of the polls. I don't know why, but they don't seem to look at polls, but polls would have showed them that the people in Egypt were vastly, vastly more orthodox or extreme or whatever you want to call it than was the government. And that, in fact, if you had an elect free election, which they did have, they'd elect a Muslim brother, which they did. It's, it's, it's amazing, but uh, uh, the one poll item that the government, U.S. government made a lot of is after 9-11 that the vast majority of people in the Muslim nations did not support it. But what they failed to report is the only people who supported it were those who thought Arabs had done it. The rest of the people thought George Bush did it. And of course they didn't support it. So, I mean, you've got to be careful of what you're looking at. In any event, one thing I think before I move on I'd like to remind you is that whatever terrorism is involved, it's mostly brother killing brother. I have a book in which we, we did a lot of calculations Looked at about 70% of everyone who's killed by a Muslim terrorist is another Muslim, uh, perhaps a terrorist as well. But uh, it's at least somebody of a different form of Muslim faith. Now, let's move to India. When India became an independent country in 1947, all of its political leaders have been educated in Great Britain. And everybody thought, Consequently, the secularization was coming with modernization, and Nehru, the first president, expected Hinduism to disappear within 40 or 50 years. And of course, that's not what happened. Uh, as India has modernized, there's been a huge Muslim revival. Uh, India is much more religious now than it was 100 years ago. You can measure it in all kinds of ways in terms of, uh, of pilgrims going to the religious sites. Uh, in 1986, 1.3 people visited, million people visited the Davi Shrine above Kashmir. Uh, last year, a top 10 million. Uh, a cliche among Indian journalists is the gods are back. A national survey in 2007 found that a third of Indians said they were more religious than they had been five years ago. And only 3% said they were less religious. 67% of Indians say they've attended a religious service in the past week. 85% say religion is important in their daily lives. And these numbers go up if you limit it only to Hindus in India. And of course, the more educated, the more religious. And then there's China. Uh, odd little story. American and Western intellectuals long believed that China was immune to religion. 1934, Edgar Snow quipped that in China, opium is the religion of the people. Uh, well, American academics and all throughout Europe giggled, agreed, and decided that the several million Chinese who were attending mission churches were rice Christians, that they went there for the benefits, and if the benefits stopped, they'd go away. And of course, then came the Chinese communists taking power in 1949. Um, 1966 came the Cultural Revolution, and religion was declared illegal and the Red Guards burned or tore down or converted into warehouses. All of the churches, all of the pagodas, all of the shrines, 
anything religious that they could find. And again, the intellectuals looked around and said, there, there is the post-religious world. We can see it. And that turned out to be the opium of Western intellectuals because the second the heat came off, religion came bringing back tens of thousands of temples have been rebuilt. And as for the rice Christians, they went underground and when the heat came off, they not only were still Christians, there were three times as many of them as there had been before. In other words, back in the days when Christians were being shot, people were joining the church in large numbers. And now with the heat off, of course, they've been joining in even larger numbers. Nobody has been really sure as to what those numbers are. Some people say 20 million, some people say 200 million. Both numbers are silly. Unfortunately, Gallup doesn't provide any data on religion in China because no foreign firms can ask questions about politics or religion in China. But a big Chinese firm did so in 2007. Huge survey, 7,000 respondents. And by hook or crook, we managed to get our hands on it. Uh, we've got it in English. Um, the calculations uh, have been corrected for the fact that people under, I mean, it's still a little bit tricky to be a Christian in China, and, uh, and so some people who are Christians uh, wouldn't tell a strange uh, survey administrator that, uh, that they were Christians, but we found ways to correct for that. And it looks like that about one, about 70 million, there's a strange thing here, Twice as many Chinese say they believe in Jesus as say that they're Christians. And that's because the Chinese are all confused about what it means to belong to organizations and all sorts of other things. But the best, the, the best conclusion is that there are about 70, were about, were about 73 million Christians in China in 2007. In various ways I managed to calculate that there were probably about uh, 10 million Christians in China in 1980. And if you do the calculation, that's a rate of growth of about 7% a year. If that rate were to hold for another 15 years, you'd have 295 million Chinese Christians, making China the largest, the nation with the largest Christian population. By the way, even in 2007, there were more Chinese Christians than there were members of the Communist Party. Not only that, but while it's illegal for members of the Communist Party to have a religion, there are plenty of Christians in the Communist Party. How do we know? Well, out in the villages, you can't keep secrets. And the local communist leader in the village, the people, you know, people know he's a Christian. So consequently, they don't make any secret of it, and there are communist leaders in the villages that have crosses on the wall of their living room. And we take that as pretty firm evidence that they've converted. Um, I think that that's enough. But the idea is that the world is really a very, very religious place. Um, I think this might be a good time to take a few questions and we don't have quite as much time, but uh, five minutes is all we'll do. Anybody? That's all right. What about the latest peer report? The, the latest peer report that says that, you know, the next whatever it is, 40, 50 years, Islam will outpace Christianity in its growth around the world? I'm sorry, I really couldn't, I, I couldn't, Hear it right. I said the, the latest Pew report, oh, the Pew Forum report. Pew. <clears throat> um, no, I won't say that. I won't say Pew. Uh, but uh, Pew is very funny. They, uh, they've got a lot of money. They do some very good research. They don't seem to know 
what it means to say, I have no religion. In the United States, when people say that, it means that they've got no denominational present, preference. Because almost all the people who say they have, I mean, there are about 4% of the American public who says they're, they're atheists. The rest of these people who say they have no religion pray, believe in angels, all sorts of things like this. And you say, well, these aren't irreligious people. What are they telling us? And what it appears to be is that their parents would have said, if you asked them their denomination, they'd have said, I'm a Lutheran, but I don't go. And what these people are saying, well, we're not really Lutherans. Or we don't really have a preference. If you asked if they were Christians, most of them would say yes. So it's a very confused thing. In China, when people say they have no religion, um, it's hard to know what they mean because most of the people who've been to a Buddhist temple in the last week say they have no religion. 76% uh, of the Chinese say they have no religion. And of them, 80% of that 76% have been uh, in a folk temple in the last two weeks. Uh, but they don't regard that. They have a very special definition of the word religion. Uh, that most things don't, I mean, most Buddhists in China will say they have no religion. They'll tell you they're a Buddhist, but they have no religion. Uh, it's very complicated stuff, and I see none of that subtly in the Pew Report. Do you think that Islam will face Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. No. They're making the assumption, you know, that people in the non-Western world have got high fertility rates without going and looking at their fertility rates. Uh, Iran's fertility rate is way below replacement level, for example. Uh, many, many Arab countries, their fertility is falling, like, very rapidly. Um, I, I, I could name, I, I think I recently saw a list of five that were below replacement and the rest streaking there. No, I don't see that at all. Um, as a matter of fact, fertility uh, is so tricky that it may, in fact, re-Christianize Europe because the, the, Philip will probably bring this up, but the Christians in Europe are the ones who are having the kids. Um, you know, there's a uh, thing that American Judaism is, is turning ultra-Orthodox because one kid per family doesn't equal 10 kids per family. Um, it, it's all very tricky. Yes? So actually, somewhat related to that question, uh, when you start talking about statistics or quoting statistics, it's, to me anyway, it can get pretty confusing to understand. So the question is, how much of the growth is really seen as or can be accounted for just a growth in population? So if the, if the percentage stays the same and the population grows, then the number oh, sure, grows. Sure, sure, sure. I've made, tried to be very careful not to talk uh, in terms of numbers, except in the case of China, because that's such a short-term kind of growth. So going from, say, 60 million to 290 million in 20 years, uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, about that. But no, that's the reason I've stuck with percentages increases, because, of course, uh, there's been population growth, particularly, say, in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but, you know, if... Population growth doesn't have any impact on the proportion of Christians if they're sitting there in excess of 90%, um, which they are. And by the way, of course, the boundaries, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa butts into uh, North Africa. You've got these terrible battles going on with Boko Haram and Nigeria, for example, because uh, uh, of that conflict. Uh, yes. Greater, do you think those type of battles are having in North, Northern Africa will result in a, a greater um, depth of religion or more of a secularization of religion in that area to, to, to get rid of the conflict? I don't see anybody leaving either Islam or Christianity as a result of these fights. Um, 
My impulse would say it might intensify the commitment on both sides. Uh, it, 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 it's hard to say, but uh, uh, in general, you know, I mean, you look around the United States and everybody says that religion is declining. And as Byron will point out, they've got everything on their side except the numbers. You know, you go to church on Sunday morning, you don't find all those empty pews they're talking about. Or if you do, you're going to the wrong church. <laughs> you mentioned the growth of... You mentioned the, the increase of Islam. Assuming that there is a distinction between Islam and radical Islam, is do any of the studies show an increase in the rad radicalization of Islam that you see? Well... That's a very difficult question. If you look at poll data, it's amazing how, I don't know, I'm grasping for a word, extreme or whatever. Let's put it this way. The overwhelming majorities in nations like Egypt and Pakistan, um, Yemen, overwhelmingly believe that anybody who deconverts from Islam should be executed. Overwhelmingly, they believe that anyone who blasphemes should be executed. They overwhelmingly support killing your daughter if she winked at somebody. So, you know, I don't know what you mean by extreme. Uh, the, will they do anything? The chances, no. Uh, and leadership is, is, is a real issue. As you notice, uh, when, 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 when the Arab Spring happened in Egypt, we found out what Mubarak had been sitting on successfully for 30 years. And now the army took back, and those guys are, are Muslims too, but they're, they're, they're not radical Muslims. They're, they're very... Uh, uh, Peace-loving, if you will. I mean, they, they really don't want attacks on Israel. They really don't want uh, to execute blasphemers, and they don't. But it's very, this is very tricky stuff. Uh, but we're not helped by people going around pretending that none of this has to do with Islam. It would be a little bit like pre pretending that the people who, who shot abortionists weren't Christians. Of course they were. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's very complicated and it's not helpful by being in denial. Thank you, Professor, for this wonderful talk this morning. I'd like to ask the question, though, <clears throat> in the signs of religious revival, are you equating religion then with superstitious re revival as well? And what would be your definition of the two terms? I would say that mysticism or involves belief in the existence of supernatural forces. I think religion takes one step beyond that and posits the existence of a conscious God. That uh, on the other hand, if I'm sitting out here being being an aggressive atheist, the fact that people have quit the Lutheran church and are now spiritualists should not give me any comfort in the sense that it's still a supernatural world to these people. Uh, the, the very beliefs that they're against are still thriving in, in spiritualism. Uh, now, that doesn't meet my religious taste, and I'm very leery about the edge of... of of what I would call supernaturalism that isn't religion, but it is still supernaturalism. And that's, that's all. No, to me, religion has to have a God. And uh, um, I would even go so far as to say a conscious God, because I don't know what you do with an unconscious God, except uh, it's, it's a word. Um, 
Yes. On that note, uh, maybe you could say something about the proportionate uh, growth of minority religions or new religious movements in comparison to the mainstream uh, world religions you've mostly been talking about, or maybe also the uh, growth in numbers of uh, minority religions and new religious movements also? Well, there are new religious movements constantly. Uh, some, uh, many of them, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's, it's estimated that there are 10,000 Christianities, independent Christian movements that are uh, locally uh, formed. Um, we certainly have all, you know, I mean, we've got 1,500 kinds of Protestants in the United States. Uh, and then, of course, there are, you know, spiritualism is, 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 is a religion, and, and, the, and it has a few churches. And the world is full of religious movements. That's certainly true. Um, Islam, and by the way, we have a tendency to make Islam monolithic, less so most recently, but they have a tendency to make Christianity monolithic. And in fact, uh, it's, it's not so. I, years ago, a, a Muslim friend of mine um, educated me by saying, I could take you to any Muslim village with four mosques, and I could point out the Episcopalian mosque, the Baptist mosque, the Nazarene mosque, and the Unitarian mosque. Uh, and he said, there's that much variety but you'd walk in there and say, hmm, bunch of Muslims. Uh, and, he, and he was quite right. Uh, um, on the reporting and statistics of Islam, um, on the reporting of statistics about Islam around the world, do you think that's just oversight, or do you think there's political motives, um, underlying racist motives, anything like that, to the what you've pointed out as false statistics coming out of various channels? I don't hear as well as I did when I was your age. And oh, I sorry. And a bit of trouble. Yeah, um, so regarding the false stories about various sectors in Islam or the rise of Islam or things like that, do you think that those are just oversights in media and statistics, or do you think that there is some kind of motivation for that? Well, there's obviously a lot of politics going on. I mean, the fact that what happened here at Fort Hood, the government re continues to call an instance of workplace violence having nothing to do with religion, uh, that's, that's not ignorance. It may be idiotic, but it's not ignorance.